Do you have any favorite uh, design patterns or optimizations you've you've built somewhere that you'd like to call out? Um, I'm very proud <laughs> of a very little stupid uh, bus script I created where it uses Forge to create um, the a TXT file uh, with the storage layout of your contract, and you add that you add that into your CI, so you commit that file, and you add that into the CI. And the idea is that with every commit or every you know, PR, you generate the storage layout of your contracts, and if the newly generated layout is different from the one you committed. That means that without you noticing, you changed the storage layout of your contract, which in the case of upgradable contracts can lead to big vulnerabilities, like one of the most usual um, vertical for vulnerabilities and hacks is storage, storage layout changing and then having all sorts of problems there. So this is a very simple way for your CI to check that and force you to commit a new storage layout. So to acknowledge right, explicitly that the storage layout changed. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Devs Do Something podcast. I'm your host, Sam Flamini, and today's guest is Odysseus.eth a protocol engineer at Nomad who has provided a ton of value to the space as both an engineer and open source contributor to various projects such as Foundry. Odysseus has a passion for decentralization, and in this episode, we discuss the technical details of what he calls the Sovereign Stack, a suite of tools he feels are important to crypto natives seeking to live decentralized lives. We also dive deep on cross-chain messaging, favorite design patterns in the Foundry codebase, and in Odysseus' own work, which include a really cool script, by the way, for tracing contract storage that I thought was awesome. And finally, the importance of focus for engineers working in this space. This is a wide-ranging conversation that decentralization maxis and protocol engineers alike will enjoy. So with that, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor and get on with today's episode. Are you a DAO or crypto native business with salaried employees? Or do you perhaps work for one? If so, whether you're a team of five or 500, your organization can save time and money by streaming salaries with Superfluid, who also happens to be the beloved producer of this podcast. With salary streaming, your management team no longer has to worry about executing multi-sig operations every month or manually executing hundreds of separate transactions to pay their team. Contributors and employees, on the other hand, get paid by the second, which, to be honest with you, is a pretty killer benefit on the receiving end. Those of us getting paid via stream can connect our wallet to the Superfluid dashboard and see our balances ticking up in real time. It's kind of mesmerizing and feels like you're being jacked 10 years in the future. When you're paid in a stream, it flows in perpetuity until your team needs to adjust compensation, which effectively puts Web3 payroll on autopilot. Salary streaming is easy to set up thanks to our recent integration with CoinShift, the leading crypto treasury management platform. In just a few clicks, you can securely set up payroll for hundreds of employees in just a single transaction, all from CoinShift's dashboard. If this sounds like something you're interested in exploring, you should visit superfluid.finance/payroll and book a salary streaming demo today. Thanks to all of our sponsors. Let's get on to the episode. Right, so we're here with Odysseus.eth. Welcome, man. Hello, Sam. Thank you for this chat. Yeah, no, we're really happy to, to have you here. Uh, I'm excited to get into a lot of your work uh, in the open source ecosystem in Web3, some of the cross-chain stuff you've worked on, Bogota, all this cool stuff that we were talking about off, off the air a second ago. But before we do that, you know, you've built a pretty decent brand on crypto Twitter. I'd love for you to just walk us through what your background is and how you got involved within crypto. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I used to work in product on DevRel um, in the Internet of Things industry on the infrastructure monitoring. So always technical, but not that much. Like It's different to 
play around with your GitHub and tech and a totally different thing to ship production code. I I saw crypto uh, for the first time in 2017 uh, for my um, master thesis. But at the time, the project I, fo- I chose to focus on was IOTA. <laughs> So I spent a a bunch of time there. I got completely disillusioned. And I was like, yeah, that's that's a total scam. And I left the space for good. So that was early 2017, which is a bit, makes me wonder how my life would be different if I chose Ethereum at the time. Anyway, (laughs) so um, around 2021, um, I read again The Sovereign Individual, the book, we talk about the the mega political changes that we are seeing uh, around us globally. And in 1995, three, I think it was um, written. It basically uh, predicted Bitcoin. It predicted uh, DeFi. It predicted a lot of things. And after reading the sovereign individual and knowing like what crypto is about, how it works, etc., and being able to map that knowledge to what I was reading, it hit me that wow, okay, you know, the world is changing. Uh, the world is changing, um, and crypto is will be a key part of that change, right? Um, so I chose to re-enter the field, and this time I chose the right community to be part of, that being Ethereum. Um, I quit my Web2 job and I decided to become a protocol engineer. So I basically focused uh, all day and all night in learning protocol and worked for uh, a few months uh, as a protocol consultant, basically. Uh, for Web3 projects uh, before joining Nomad as a protocol engineer. Very cool. Very cool. So you got hardcore, uh, you got probably crypto pilled at first with IOTA? Uh, I got crypto pilled, um, yeah, like back then I was doing a of things and I cared about uh, data provenance and how you can use a blockchain to anchor uh, sensor data points, which makes no sense. <laughs> It was, you know, it was back then where crypto would be every, everything. We would be so horny to crypto, crypto and logistics, crypto and that, crypto and there. You know, that was the the ICO era. Right. We'll just put everything on the blockchain, right? Dentacoin. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I, that was uh, that was a little bit before I got involved in the space. But I, I I do have people that I'm friends with now tell me lots of stories. Um, so you read the sovereign individual. That's interesting because we'll get into the sovereign stack in a second. But what made you choose Ethereum the second time? First of all, DeFi had product market fit. Um, like that was and still is very clear. It's probably the only pr- clear product market fit we are we have. Although I'm not a big fan of DeFi, so it was the ecosystem where everything was happening. Nice. And what did, what did you learn at first? Did you just dive into Solidity, or did you start reading white papers? Like, what was what were the first couple of uh, months like on that journey um solidity i i started with uh crypto zombies um actually i i I did like an nft project as everybody has done at some point you know this is the scene everybody has so it was uh yeah crypto zombies and learning basic solidity um i had an understanding of how the protocol works because of my prior prior research i understood how a blockchain works like i may maybe I wasn't familiar with the yellow uh, paper for Ethereum, but I was familiar with uh, uh, the mental models uh, of how blockchain works, how Bitcoin works, etc. Nice. Now that makes a lot of sense. So you, you got involved. You started building smart contracts. You were you were a protocol consultant. Yeah. And it seems like if I just like look at your blog and kind of trace back some of the work you've done, this sovereign stack, this this decentralized uh, this focus on decentralized systems, things that you that you can basically like kind of see the early seeds of in the sovereign individual. And I would love for you to expand on a blog post you wrote recently about the sovereign stack. 
Uh, can you walk us through just at a high level, like what the sovereign stack is and, and what it looks like? Yeah, um, the sovereign stack actually is something I came up with, like a term during my deep dive into Orbit, which uh, I assume you will ask me later. <laughs> but the premise is very simple: that the Web two, you know, software is hitting the world, like Mark Andreessen said, and that's true. Um, but in order to scale fast, we we made the pact with the devil. And it got very centralized. We have, you know, you have a lot, a lot of services. But then, if you go as you go do- towards the hardware, you have less and less players in the market. So there are very few players in the in the um, the companies that produce chips. Maybe a few more players in the data center um, market. And then, as you go up, there are more and more players. Um, and that's a very centralized you know, reality where the own, um, basically your entire life, like all your entire life is in their data centers. And that we've seen with um, Snowden, uh, this is not really private. It's, it's, it's the same as sovereign. Like it's, when you're sovereign, really sovereign, you have the power to choose. That's the sovereign. Like if you, choose or you have the power or the freedom to choose because someone allows you to, that's not sovereignty. So that's why in, for example, the, um, the government where you have both a democratic uh, government and the uh, a king, uh, the king is sovereign. There is nothing above the king. Uh, but the king is above the government, at least in, in theory, right? That's why the, the king is called the sovereign so in that respect, our data, our digital lives are not sovereign, right? Uh, the sovereign stack is basically the answer to that, which, uh, which means that it's software that it's censorship resistant, privacy first, um, open, um, open source. And on, not only that, it's also a stack. So it's not uh, disparate islands of software. But I call it a stack because, you know, we have experts in many fields. For example, we are in the blockchain field, but we tend to focus only on our field or expertise. And we ignore what else exists outside. And we need all the layers of the stack to have um, more sovereignty. Like blockchain has some use cases. Um, it's a critical part of the sovereign stack, but it's, it's not only that. You need some, uh, some way to communicate. Uh, with an end-to-end encryption. You need some way to collaborate with code, for example. So the sovereign stack is nothing else but an attempt to organize all this disparate software and place it into like, um, a logic st- um, a stack and say to everyone, hey, guys, like you're not alone. Like You're not... Um, Pick outside of your expertise and see the the picture in its totality, and understand how your expertise and your your software fits into the grander uh, puzzle. Yeah, so I think one of the one of the things that I mean, I guess I shouldn't say they're entirely removed from blockchains because I think there's some kind of registry that Urbit deployed on the Ethereum network. I, you, you can maybe educate me on what that was, but they're mostly the like, Urbit is a technology. It's not, it's not a blockchain, right? It's not some kind of crypto protocol. It's its own thing. Yeah. So, I mean, we have, we have a fairly technical audience, right? I mean, Urbit's, Urbit's pretty weird, even if you are technical. Uh, but I'd love for you, to under, like, like for you to give us like a brief, if it's possible, technical overview to Urbit. Uh, just, just give us like the lay of the land, right? Don't, don't, don't worry about giving us an insane deep dive, but like... Just give us like the five minute intro so that people that are curious can maybe go do the additional research on their own. Airbrit is a computer, and we'll talk about that, and an identity. So two big pieces. The idea is that the premise is that all the software, the software that we're running now, it's not meant for the 21st century. It was like um, architected into the 80s. And it has resulted to 
a complexity of unimaginable scale. So we want to go back to peer-to-peer -peer computers without intermediate clouds. And to do that, we will re-architecture the entire thing. So a new kind of VM, so a new assembly language. On top, we're going to build a new OS. Um, we'll build a new op, uh, high level um, programming language. Um, and this, of course, system will have a new kind of OS, a new kind of networking, everything. Everything from the ground up, it's new. And some of its design principles is that it's simple or uh, it's better to manage complexity. And the idea is that you have a fully deterministic computer. So you have your orbit and if you feed it a, a log, so I have my orbit now, that's my computer, the messages, etc. If I export a log and I go to another orbit and I import the log, the new um, orbit will reach the exact same state, the exact same state. So the same messages, the same everything. And all these computers are tied to an, ed an ID, um, which is your identity in your network, which uh, has uh, its digital scars, artificial scars. So it's like 4 billion identities on purpose. So um, it's, a, it's a civil resistance and also a way to filter, you know, an email, an Ethereum address. They, it's trivial to create thousands of them, right? But in Arabic, since you have uh, scarce identities, they cost something. That's the idea. And so you, when, so the, when this computer participates in the network, it does so under an ID, so a set of ne network keys, basically. So anyone that talks with this computer knows who is this computer, which ID. Um, and it uses Ethereum, as you mentioned, for its public key infrastructure. So, you know, I will see a network key and I'll go to the Ethereum blockchain to see, okay, this network key belongs to that ID. Uh, because you can, you know, change your network keys, etc. Um, so the Ethereum is just the PKI. Uh, it's an implementation detail. It could be anything. Um, and that's Urbit. That's good. Good overview. So one thing I think, for for my for my clarification, is is Urbit basically just a virtual machine that I can run anywhere? Yes. And everything that happens on it is still private, so I could run an instance of Urbit on some AWS server, but what what's happening is AWS is still unable to see what's happening. It, it can't access the, the logs that, yeah. that Urbit's generating. Right, it, that's, it, that, that's the idea. It can generate, it, it can access. The mental model to have is the browser. So if you think of the browser, it's a, it's a mini VM, right? It's a VM that runs your web apps uh, with V8. It's like a full-fledged VM. So that's Urbit in a way. Gotcha. And the vision is that this can be used. I think Urbit, the, the Urbit team, whatever the company is that maintains Urbit. Talon. Talon, yes. They released like a chat feature, didn't they? So I think the, the prime, like Urbit best use case right now is social computing because it's peer to peer. Um, you don't need to, you know, you don't need to, to have the Facebook complexity if your Facebook application only supports like the, I don't know, the 200 people you talk to, right? Since it's a peer-to-peer, -peer, um, everything's peer-to-peer. -peer. And I like that in the respect, it's like human societies in the real world. Like you, you don't go, go to, um, to, your, you know, to your small community and you suddenly have direct access to millions of people. Like you organically um, discover communities by, you know, maybe a friend of yours is doing a tango class. So he invites you and you go to a tango class and then you see a new group, a new uh, community. So in Arab, it's the same. Like you have groups and in order to find a group, you can't find, there is no central index. Someone has to point you to that group and say, hey, that um, Arab, there is a group. So I like in that respect, it's, it feels very organic and um, akin to real life. Um, so the primary use case is shipping like a Discord killer, basically, which is of course uncensorable. Um, they can't, no one can censor you. It's peer to peer, um, yeah, and it should be easy to integrate with a lot of crypto native um, 
yeah, attributes. That's cool. Yeah, it's like the same human interactions, but you remove the I have Sauron there in the background that sees everything. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. So on the topic of uncensorable things, I mean, there was the the debacle that went down recently with Tornado Cash and code just being wiped from GitHub, right? So people kind of woke up and realized, wait a second. You know, we're all shipping code for decentralized systems, but the, the platform we're shipping it on and maintaining it on and using for all this code collaboration is a platform that, that could censor us in the end. So there's been a lot of interest around decentralized op- options for code collaboration, uh, like hosting, you know, smart contract files and all that stuff, right? And, and radicals come up a lot. Uh, can you give us an overview? Like, let, let's say let's say I'm someone who works in crypto. And my whole entire code base is on GitHub, right? And I'm looking for alternatives. Uh, is Radical one of those alternatives? And, and if so, can you give us a quick overview of what it is? Um, Radical is a very interesting project. Um, basically, it takes Git, which is, in a way, a decentralized protocol. I host my repositories. You can pull from them. You can push them. Um but in Git, you don't have any identity layer. So if I see a repository, I don't know if that is the original repository or if it's a clone. There is no uh, identity metadata. So Radical, in essence, takes that uh, the Git and, and places it up an identity um, layer. So when you, <clears throat> you see a project in the network, you know whose project is that, if that is the original project or the one you consider original. So if that's pro- so, you can see the project is owned by that user um, and you can see its history and all that in a, in a very cryptographic um, uh, yeah, way with identities. So take it, add, the, add an identity layer, then on top of it, add the replication layer, which is uh, with gossiping. Um, Currently, the Radical, as I know, I used to be a contributor in Radical. Now I always uh, follow it because I'm a very big fan of it. Um, there is the third, I think, protocol iteration right now. So a new protocol has been created from the learnings of the current protocol. And the idea is that there is no, um, there is no GitHub, there is no canonical version. Uh, the canonical version is who you define it to be. So I define the canonical version of my project to be um, that project ID coupled with that user ID. So that's the canonical version. And if I see the same project by by some other user, that means that it's a fork. Interesting. So I mean, you you keep the same kind of mental model around versioning. Yeah. But what, what about what about some of the other things that people are used to? with GitHub, right? So like, let's say, for example, it's super fluid for our, our protocol and our contracts and things. Anytime we want to add a new feature, I mean, the number of GitHub actions is just insane, right? We have, we have <laughs> a ton of workflows. We have a ton of checks, right? Because this is, this, is, you know, this is pretty you know, intense stuff, right? You don't want yeah. to miss one of those. So how does Radical, do, do they have any CI, CD pipeline stuff? Or is that in the works or like, like how how people try to approach that side of it? Um, I'm not sure if the what the roadmap, but it's Git, right? So you would need to implement your own CI CD. Uh, maybe you have a Jenkins server somewhere, um, and then create your own CI CD with prehooks and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's uh, for sure when you go from a centralized service to a P2P solution, you will get a hit on the user experience. That's um, a price you, you know you will pay. The question for these tools is, how can we minimize the price? Right. Yeah, I think there would be a lot of opportunities here. And that, that's kind of how I saw your, your Sovereign Stack post. It was like, yes, this is what exists today. But that kind of thing gets people thinking about all right, this this is this as an area of software that's going to matter, and I think there will, there will be engineers that will read your post that go, all right, what can I build? What can I contribute to this stack? Um, is there anything that's top of mind for you that you wish people would build 
that would plug into the sovereign stack somewhere? Uh, so I think two issues still exist. One thing is the wallet. I, I, I don't think anyone has really nailed it. I feel there are a lot of low-hanging fruits in wallets uh, in the way of experience for the users, like, for example, simulating a transaction and seeing the results and asking the user if they are sure they want to do it. Um, and the wallet is important because it's your interface for the blockchain space, basically. So I think a wallet is a big problem, uh, an open problem still. And another, I think, is uh, privacy, of course. So messages. Um, Signal is a very good option. Orbit is another option. Um, you know, self-hosted discourse is another option. Um, Matrix. So how can we improve these tools and make it more friendly for developers to actually use them, right, to easily set, the, set them up? I think connectivity is a big very big uh, important aspect that I'm not sure users can really tackle it. Um, like for example, Starlink, you can't have sovereignty in China uh, unless you find a way to bypass the, the Great Wall. And for example, Star Starlink could be an option for that, right? You carry your own internet terminal with you. Um, but I'm not sure how anyone would be able to participate in that um, layer without couple of billions <laughs> yeah launch your own satellites yeah yeah so sounds uh hard to say the least right i know i i agree with you right it's things at the hardware level you know I mean, it's it's challenging to see them as being able to be purely decentralized like one example of that is on like the crypto phone the idea of like building a crypto phone right i would love to see a crypto phone like like Balaji, for example has, has talked about this at length for a while Right. At the, in the end, we probably need a phone. The thing about building phones is that there's a lot of economies of scale to building phones. I mean, go ask Apple or yeah, or people that build Samsung phones. Right. I don't. I don't know. I mean, what's your take on decentralizing things that are at the hardware level? Is that is that like near term possible? If 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 at all ever? Like, what do you have like a, a take on whether or not we should be decentralizing those things? Well. You can always carry your Raspberry Pi with you and host your own services. I think, I'm not sure you need specialized hardware. You just need to good commodity hardware like an Intel Nook or Raspberry Pi. And then you need a very slick software stuck on top of it that actually is easy to use. And it's not uh, a total nightmare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think that, you know, being able to do things on commoditized hardware, that is more of a software problem. And if we can solve that, we do, we open up a lot of potential, I think. Uh, I, I feel like I saw in a tweet somewhere, I don't know, I don't know where I saw this. This is kind of random, but you mentioned that when you travel from city to city, you're, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think your device of choice is just a Raspberry Pi. Is that right? I mean, depending on the use case. Uh, for example, a Raspberry Pi can be perfect to host uh, an Orbit, a mail server, um, you know, you can host some services you care about and then you can use a, basically a cloud server as a, I call it an anchor, which basically it's uh, creates a channel to the Raspberry Pi directly and the outside world connects to that cloud. And that's uh, ideal because you, you, you have the accessibility of the cloud, but the cloud just transfer all the data locally and your data always stays, stays in your hardware and communicates to the cloud through an encrypted channel, uh, right? Um, and that's censorship resistant because if, for example, you are a dissident or something and AWS cracks down on your cloud and close your account, you just open a new, a new gateway in another cloud service and you do the same thing. Yeah, no, I mean, I think being able to travel lean like that and make use of, of commodity hardware and, and the cloud as needed is, is interesting, right? Because most of our industry is very nomadic, right? Like we just both came from Bogota, right? A lot of people there. I don't think really think through their OPSEC all that well or what they're bringing all that well. Um, and I think it's, it's worth keeping in mind like how you're going to approach that process if you do want to stay more anonymous or censorship resistant. Yeah, uh, so I think I think that makes sense to to think through. And I think an important part here is always think think of the 
the jurisdiction. It's different to use, if, for example, there are VPNs in friendly jurisdictions with very hard data privacy laws. In VPNs, it's not so friendly. Um, so, of course, you're not always 100% sure of it. Like, even Proton Email gave um, a friend's uh, activists uh, um, IP and information to the French authorities when it was asked by the Switzerland authorities, right? So it's not one, it's one hundred percent, but it's more you know, secure than probably the your Gmail account. Yeah, no, it's definitely on a spectrum. It's definitely on a spectrum. Uh, on the topic of Bogota, what was your uh, overall take on the event? Did you go to lots of talks? Did you see? Did you have lots of good technical conversations? Would love just your general feedback on what DevCon was like. Um, I think it was mainstream yeah I think it went mainstream like this year was really mainstream which is a very good thing because we have a lot of new players and developers entering the space and you know you have the hockey stick dynamics right so I think that's a great it was an amazing experience for me yeah you know I, I, I had a, a blast as well I mean I, I hope that you know, the mainstream comment, I, I hope you're right in that, you know, we can uh, start building useful things. Um, I, I think I've seen you just, just kind of flipping through your Twitter this morning. You've been critical of some of the, the focus, I guess, of some of the smartest players in the, play, in, in the space on things that might be frivolous or just kind of throwing money in circles in DeFi. Uh, what do you think that we need to build that would pull us more into the mainstream and useful applications? Like, are there any blind spots you think we're just not focusing on that we should be? Yeah, but there is not a lot of money in that, right? <laughs> like Tornado, I think it was, uh, like priv- privacy preserving technology is super important. And I think we're losing the fight. We are winning the fight in the open API, uh, you know, money blocks vertical, but we're losing the fight in, uh, decentralization in privacy. Um, and I'm not sure, like, personally, if, like, creating a 10% more efficient Uniswap is worth millions of dollars in human capital and money, and you know, and man hours versus something like a tornado. Mm-hmm. Did you follow any of the developments or any of the talks around zero-knowledge stuff? Did you like I, I've seen a lot of good activity around Aztec and Noir, but I don't know yes. if you've seen anything as well or done any research yourself. Aztec is still a US company. So I, I love Aztec. Like I, I I love it. It's it's you know one of the few players that say, okay, we care about privacy. Um but it's still a US company. So I guess the real win here would be for Aztec to succeed and someone forking them. And create you creating an anon Aztec. That'd be pretty wild. But I mean, I think you know the to really work on privacy preserving things. I think you do. We do need some anon players to do that, right? It's it's going to be very tough for a U.S. person or someone based in the EU very publicly to go out and do it, right? It's just one hundred percent. I I there was a a side event on privacy in Bogota where Snowden. Uh, talk I heard about this live. Yeah, it was uh, wild, and he mentioned something very sp- simple: that the most successful project of all time, which is probably Bitcoin, is created by a person who nobody knows who he is or she is. Um, they haven't moved any of their coins, nothing, and probably they believe that no matter how many billions they have, like hundreds of billions, I think, right now it still wouldn't protect them from the people who would come after them because they created Bitcoin. So when you're creating tech and you're thinking, should I go Anon or not? You should think about how how disturbing the technology will be for the status quo. And I think the Tornado developers underestimated how much the project really in the end upset the status quo. So you, you should ask 
uh, how disrupting is the technology. And if people get mad, is my success enough to protect me? Or like these walls of money? Or in the end, only true privacy can be um, a wall of math that can truly protect you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember listening to an interview with one of the Tornado, I think the main guy who built Tornado Cash, and the interview asked him, like, are you sure? But did you ever think about going in on with this? And I don't, I don't remember what the answer was, but I think you're right. Unfortunately, with those kinds of things, it's, with those kinds of things, it's so disruptive to nation states that people will try to find you. I mean, honestly, credit to Satoshi for literally the nation state level opsec on not getting found, unless it was Hal Finney and Hal Finney died, and that's then that's why it happened. Yeah. But uh, uh, who knows? I, I know I, people have been doing even grammar-based analysis and word frequencing on their blog posts to be able to understand patterns that they can pattern much to other known computer scientists. So people will try to find out. That's that's the lesson. Uh, shifting gears a little bit to more like technical technical development stuff, right? So you've, you've spent a lot of time writing smart contracts, thinking about protocols, building stuff, right? You've shipped a lot of independent projects. You've worked at Nomad for a while. I'd love to just understand, like, from a high-level point of view, what, like, as someone who's spent a lot of time with smart contracts yourself, what do most, like, early career Solidity developers and smart contract developers get wrong when they're building a system? Do you see any common mistakes, things you wish people would just stop doing? I think the hardest part when you enter the... I'll, I'll answer dif- a, a, a bit differently, a different question. I think the problem with newcomers in the space, I, I, at least it was for me, there is too much noise. Too much noise um, from projects and people that are not necessarily intellectually honest. So you have to spend a considerable amount of time to identify that and not spend time in projects that they don't have necessarily um, a sound technical foundation. So basically you will learn things that are either wrong or useless. Um, as I did, for example, when I dived into IOTA, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, my suggestion is for people to really try to identify the builders. Um, there is a very specific group of people like in the heart of the com- Ethereum community uh, that are very, you know, shippers. They just ship code relentlessly and observe the patterns, like which projects do the people care about? What problems do these people care about? And this will identify what you should care about and what problems you should care about. So what problems are truly important? Uh, what technology is truly useful? It's cutting through all that noise and going for the high signal, uh, Twitter. And Twitter is like, whenever I'm talking about community and crypto community, I mentioned, I mean Twitter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, CT, CT, ladies and yeah, gentlemen. City. City, yeah, CT, CT, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, why do you think the noise is there? I mean, is, is it... Is it like financial, financially related where you see these things? Is, is it just tough to... Too like much money. Thing? Yeah, money. Interesting. Too much money. Like if there's too much money and there is not enough problems to go around. So a lot of people just... Uh, a lot of projects for me are solutionism. You know, you're, you, you have money and you don't have a problem. So you're trying to find a problem to fit your solution, which you, you care about. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have any societal value. So any real user value. I think that the, the dangerous thing with solutionism too is that things that are really technically satisfying can still be a waste of time, right? That's, that, that's the dangerous thing, right? So let's say, let's say you meet somebody who's really bright, really bright, really bright engineer. They're getting some funding to work on whatever they're working on, but you see they're, they're probably solving a problem that doesn't exist. Like how would you try to convince them to work on things that are maybe more long-term oriented projects or things that just consider a user or customer instead of just the technical complexity. Do you have any advice for someone that is caught up in the solutionism? I mean, there is the project management 
avenue, which like talk with users, you know, just follow the product management textbook, uh, which like talk with users, um, identify the problem, um, the five guys, etc. So there is a lot of um, knowledge out there for you to Google. Uh, but I think the most, <laughs> I think the most useful would be to let them fail <laughs> and learn it by, yeah, by failing. It's all interesting. And I mean, it's stuff that I think about a lot as well. I mean, I don't want to work on vaporware, right? I've thought about this a lot. I mean, and honestly, sometimes it makes you like think, man, like, you know, is, is this whole industry just focused on the wrong things sometimes? And I think it is, you know? So for, and I guess you, so you, you did DevRel as well, right? So you kind of, so you kind of saw developer communities build, like being built in web two. Uh, do yeah. you think that there are any developer communities in particular that are doing a really good job of like bringing people in outside of the core Ethereum ecosystem? Like if you looked at all of the other ecosystems uh, and, and been impressed with anything in terms of like recruiting people that are very problem oriented and like trying to build actually good technology. So you mean other blockchains? Yeah, either other blockchains or just L2s or ecosystems that are, are trying to be built in general. Well, like uh, for me, L2s are aligned with Ethereum. So Optimism, Arbitrum, Fuel, I don't know if I'm forgetting anything. I'm, I'm, I think they are, I would consider them part of the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, I think, although personally I don't, I don't agree with uh, the Solana, for example, um, architectural d- designs uh, and choices. Personally, that's my personal opinion. But I think it's super interesting seeing all this developer community created out of like thin air. And it attracted a lot of developers and a lot of people wanted to build a Solana and they built interesting things. So I think when um, an ecosystem manages to do that, then you um, you want to look into that and see what what they did right. Yeah. You, no. you, I have to respect them for that, you know? Yeah. No, it's true. They, they generated a lot of attention. I mean, I think Fuel is doing a pretty good job right now as well of at least mm-hmm. like on like the marketing and awareness side. I think, you know, it seems like Fuel is everywhere. Uh, and I think that that, that says yeah. something. We'll see what happens long term, but I think there are a lot of smart people there. Uh, and I think something interesting yeah. will come out of it. Um, I think uh, in the layer two space, I think the one like driving the narrative not in, right now is optimism. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it has a lot of members that have been into the very core of the Ethereum ecosystem for like since forever, so, so that's understandable. Uh, but yeah, I agree. I like Fuel, which has a very different um, approach, building on instead of trying to improve the EVM, um, take the learnings from the EVM and creating something entirely new. And I mean, Fuel, it is the only, you know the first optimistic rollup in Ethereum with uh, like fraud proofs, right? In, mm-hmm. Uh, Chris from L2 tried to attack the system a few months ago. Fuel V1, which is like a dead network, of course. So he 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 set up a sequencer and he submitted a fraudulent transaction, and the watcher out of nowhere uh, slashed him. So the system Fuel V1, which is like a dead network, is still operationally secure in the sense that there are still watchers that will submit fraud proofs if they see fraud. And it's the only optimistic system that has ever done this. Interesting. Like plain and simple. Yeah. I mean, it works. It works. It has proof. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly. Yeah. That's it was very interesting. I, I really suggest you look into the Twitter thread. Uh, Chris created about it. I think it was super interesting to see it um, in real life. And... As always, the dark forest. Like you, you don't know how many watches there are, and that's actually one of the um, the attributes you say about nomad. Like you don't know how many watches there are. So, as an attacker, you have no idea if the system is. You have yeah. to try it and pay the cost. It's interesting. Yeah, it's it's economic security, right? That that's that's part of the mindset. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. When it so when it comes to these different like L2s and different side chains and, and ecosystems and stuff like that. One big narrative right now that, that's been important for a long time, at least recognized as important, is 
the cross-chain space, right? You've, you've obviously focused a lot on cross-chain technology and messaging and, and all, all that stuff. What is your take on the current cross-chain environment and like where we go from here? I mean, obviously Nomad's done great work. Connects has done great work. Uh, there's been other protocols that have popped up, but would love your take as someone who's been on the inside for a while. So basically we have like three big families um, of uh, designs. Um, first, we have the validator based. So you have basically a multisig that agrees that a message is valid, so we should transfer it. Um, then you have a light client base where the receiving chain can natively verify the consensus of the sending chain so they can they will receive a message and verify that this message has indeed been included into the blockchain and it was valid for the sending blockchain's consensus rules. And the third is like the optimistic design where that Nomad does, where um, in Nomad you have the validator, let's say, that um, sends the message but there is an optimistic window and in case the message is fraudulent, this updater will be, will be slashed. So in the validator scheme, you need um, N out of M trusted parties, right? It's a multisig. In, um, in an optimistic system, you need at least one honest party, which is the watcher and is uh, um, chosen by the application. So there is no network-wide watchers. Every application chooses their own watcher. Um, so we move the trust to the user and say, you decide who you trust to protect your application. Um, so these are the three big designs. And it's a very complex, ah, of course. And this is like the, more, the, the, native, the designs that exist now. And of course, as zero knowledge technology will evolve, we will see more and more Zillo knowledge based bridges. Um, but that's a very complex uh, endeavor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's like the mindset of, of taking things away from let's just like, like literally like a, like a drawbridge with a, a team of people that can basically have to total control over the entire system. Moving away from that to this model of crypto, crypto economic security, I think was the right one, right? And just and just doing research on what, what you've worked on uh, and your team have worked on, doing research and even like a lot of Connects thoughts on on the topic as well. I think they're all pretty spot on. Yeah. Uh, we actually did, we did an episode with Rahul from Connects uh, a month or two ago and learned a lot about it. So nice. yeah, no, we're excited for all the new developments there for sure. Uh, all right, couple couple other things I want to talk through. Just again on the developer side, one of them is regarding your open source contributions, right? You've been like yeah. I said, you've been active. You did you did some open source work with Foundry. Uh, you've produced a lot of like individual side projects. It looks like you've done maybe even some work with Urbit and open source stuff there. What advice do you have for developers looking to make those open source contributions? So doing open source is super useful because you learn a lot. Uh, basically, the deal is that you contribute a future, so you contribute your time, and you get back feedback and attention from developers that they wouldn't give it otherwise. And that's fair because they are senior developers. So with Foundry, for example, it was I you know contribute a lot of time. But in, as what I got back was I learned a lot about tooling and Rust and how to and the EVM and how the EVM works, right? And I got amazing feedback from you know the core contributors in Foundry, where who are titans in the space, very senior developers. Um, so I would really advise people to find good open source projects that they, they care about. You have to care about you because you will spend a lot of time and contribute as much as they can. And for sure, what they will receive back, you know, apart from <laughs> dopamine, apart from having fun, which is, should be an important aspect of it. And it is, but even from a purely utilitarian perspective, 
you will get back more th- than you will give. Um, the feedback you will get will make you a much better developer. And what what was the open source landscape like in Web two as compared to Web three? Are they are they pretty much the same? Are people more welcoming here? Like what what have the experiences been like? I don't know if you have made any open source contributions in Web two. Yeah, uh, but would love your your thoughts on the contrast. I'm not sure. I think the web in open source ethos. I'm not sure there's a big difference. I would say that Web3 is much smaller. Yeah. So contributing to Web3 is like building software with your friends <laughs> because it's like the same people again and again in different projects. Yep. The, the communities, in the grand scheme of things, it's minuscule. Yep. Yeah, and I would even say that things that look like they're more like company-based as well, right? Like let's say there's a lot of, a lot of organizations have like... A, XYZ labs that maintain a protocol. It might look like yeah. they have a team of full-time engineers and stuff that are building a protocol, but in a lot of situations, you can go to a code base and open up a PR and people are pumped to have you there in, in a lot of situations, not yeah. every situation, but I would actually recommend that if, if someone listening is just really curious about that, like a, a particular protocol and they like to contribute, just go for it, right? And people will at least have a conversation with you. Um, yeah. Uh, a quick plug for Foundry, I think, if you care about deeply understanding this solidity and dev tooling, which is also security, and third, Rust, you should consider to contribute to Foundry. Um, you will learn, of course, Rust. You will learn how, you know, best practices for dev tooling and how to make tooling that helps users create more secure code. So you will learn how to build how what how to build more secure code uh, for example solidity you will learn about a lot about security on you know if you're uh, courageous enough uh, even about DVM so I think it's a it's a phenomenal project to contribute and it has amazing people like Georgios broke Matt uh, Oliver like they're amazing people that they will give you feedback in there like Titans in the space. It's really rare, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people compliment the Foundry code base as well. I mean, it's natural. There's a lot of gigabrains there. But it's it's purposely built in a way that's clean and easily readable. So it was from the beginning to build, you know, if if you know Rust, you will immediately understand the difference between Foundry and other Rust code bases. Foundry was purposefully, since you know, Georgia started building it in last August, in a way that it's easily understandable. Uh, it's, a, it's a code that's it's clean code. It's idiomatic code, which means it follows uh, Rust's best practices. It has a lot of tests. Like it's, even if you only care about Rust, it's a good code base to learn about how to write Rust software. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the topic of best practices and like just clean code, do you have any favorite uh, design patterns or optimizations you've, you've built somewhere that you'd like to call out? Um, I'm very proud of a very little stupid uh, bash script I created where it uses forge to create um, the a txt file uh, with the storage layout of your contract and you add that you add that into your CI so you commit that file and you add that, that into the CI and the idea is that every, with every commit or every you know PR you generate the storage layout of your contracts and if the newly generated layout is different from the one you committed that means that without you noticing you changed the storage layout of your contract which in the case of upgradable contracts can lead to big vulnerabilities, like one of the most usual um, vertical for vulnerabilities and hacks is storage, storage layout changing and then having all sorts of problems there. So this is a very simple way 
um, to for your CI to check that and force you to commit a new storage layout. So to acknowledge right explicitly that the storage layout changed for the CI to pass. That's really cool. That's good both for security and just for education, right? Yeah. To see how things have changed. I mean, we actually had so someone we had on last week was this 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 pseudo anon guy named Vex who's big into Huff. Mm-hmm. Right, and he, he talks about some of those low level languages as great ways to learn about the EVM too. Have you have you looked at any of the low level stuff at all? Like, have you played around with Yule or Huff much? I've played a lot with uh, you know bytes and assembly in Solidity, but I haven't found the the time with Huff mainly because I think if you spend too much time in too many different projects, you will never become an expert in one. So personally, I have preferred to double down on how to build secure code with Solidity than looking into something else. Yeah. Well, it goes back to the noise concept, right? I think that that's one thing that to be careful of, right? That I've, I've fallen prey to a few times is just that so it's not just financial stuff, right? It's not just like there's money over here in this different thing. It's just that this is just technically cool. So you end up spreading yourself too thin, too thin mentally and don't focus. Yeah. So I think that's actually a really good, like you saying that is actually probably a pretty good example for like younger devs who haven't been around as long to like really consider what they're focusing on and where they're allocating their time. So I think that's actually a really good mindset to have. I'm with yeah, you. I think like, okay, if you just want to have fun, Fun shouldn't be utilitarian. Like, just have fun, whatever you, you want to do, right? But, for example, if you want to become better solid developer, I'm not sure it makes... For example, I'm not sure it's worth your time to gas golf or to find all this nuisance in EVM gas costs or half than, for example, reading about... Um, formal verification and understanding what environment tests are. How do you do environment testing? Um, which will allow you to create provable secure code. Um, yeah. If you, if you just optimize for becoming a very good protocol engineer. Yeah. Do you think gas golfing has gone too far? It's a game. <laughs> I think. I mean, I, I, I think the best uh, tweet I, see, I saw from Dan Robinson, I think, which is Basically, it's a filter function for uh, uh, for intelligence, which I accept. <laughs> Personally, I don't find it interesting. Like I, I will not find it interesting to spend like three hours in 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 this meaningless uh, game in my mind. Mm-hmm. I prefer to read a book. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a more holistic, I think, view of the space, right? I mean, I think uh, you obviously care a lot about the technical side, but you know, I think you you want to make sure you're building stuff that's useful and. You know, it, to do that, you can't only think about code and gas golfing and little optimizations. It's you know, there's there's a lot there's a lot more to it than that. And obviously, my code will be less performant or less gas optimized than you know code produced by these people that write half and like understand the VM at the bytecode at the <clears throat> at the opcode level. I'm sure that their code will be more optimized, one hundred percent. The question I'm posing here is whether this is worth your time based on your unique interests and in the sequences. Yeah, it doesn't matter how optimized it is if no one uses it, right? That's that's important to keep in mind. Or honestly, we, we have another soundbite from somebody who came on from UMA a couple couple weeks ago who said, uh, it doesn't matter how optimized or fast or whatever your, your code is if you get hacked. It doesn't matter, right? So Right. Yeah, I think uh, my point is that be explicit about what you optimize for. So uh, for me, I'm I'm willing to take the hit in not understanding the VM in gas golfing terms or not being able to produce the the smallest bytecode for something. And to be able to spend that time in some other endeavor that I think is more enriching to me or my professional life. Yeah. But I'm not saying it's bad or it's meaningless. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you there. I think you, you, have, you have the right nuanced view, I think. 
No, that, that, those are some really useful, really useful thoughts. All right, last question for you, and then we'll, we'll, we'll pack it up for today. This is much more general, right? Way more general than, I guess we, we've, we've talked about some general things, but let, let's say we, we fast forward 10 years in the future, right? And we look around and we see what's, what's been built by that time. What, what do you hope our industry looks like at that point in the early 2030s? What do you hope we built in the 2020s? Um, a quote that I like a lot about um, Balaji is build it now so it's ready then. Build it now so it's ready then. So that's something that um, informs my thinking a lot. In my mind, I would prefer to see a space that allows a more diverse um, palette of use cases from identity, you know, <clears throat> uh, work, code collaboration, communication, etc., than a non-chain um, Wall Street with open APIs and you know just financial applications. So the non the hopefully the world isn't only about DeFi then, or our world isn't only about it, DeFi. It, we will have DeFi is a vital, you know, you know, wealth. Um, have a bank, have an on-chain bank that performs the a bank services, which is yeah. it's a very vital for the system. And wealth management and be able to invest. Sure, that's super important, but not only that. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, it makes sense, and it maps to your actions so far in the space as well, right? Yeah, and maybe if we don't have the more the most capital efficient Uniswap. I'm willing to make the trade in return for more privacy preserving tech or a better wallet experience or a better developer experience or, you know, in investing that the capital and man hours would need to build the ultra optimized DeFi services, divert that, um, that resource into building other things. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Where, where can people find you online? Where would you like to point people? Um, Twitter. And my blog, of course. Nice. Nice. Yeah, we'll make sure we link to it. Go follow Odysseus.eth on Twitter. Uh, go check out his work on GitHub. I'll, I'll put a link to your GitHub there in, in, in the show notes as well so people can see your work. And yeah, thank yep. you again. Thank you, Sam.